Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Edge of the Universe. This hour, we have John M. Olson here to talk about self-editing tricks. Take it away. Hey, everybody. I am so glad to be here to talk to you. Um, this is uh, a great opportunity to just get together. It's a little bit of an unusual environment for those of you that are more used to the uh, live presentations, but I think we can still cover a lot of great material here. So. Uh, we're going to be talking about self-editing tricks, uh, improving your manuscript before other people see it. Uh, so you've got this novel manuscript. You want to make the best impression possible with agents, with editors, or even with your beta readers. Uh, so we we'll use my experience with self-editing several novels, my independent and small press editing to review some of the why and how and what that's required uh, to find and fix problems before your uh, book moves uh, farther down the pipeline. So we'll also review a little bit on software tools, a uh, range of editing techniques, as well as uh, covering what you need to know to be effective when you're doing some of those things. Uh, I'll cover a little bit on tools that you can use and also on how those tools will sometimes lie to you and what you can do to minimize that betrayal. Uh, so let's get moving on here. Um, you can see on here, I've got a few editing credits there. Uh, maybe people listening in here that have a lot more editing experience than I have. And so as we're going through, you'll be able to put questions uh, in the chat and we'll have some time at the end to talk about some of those. Uh, some of you, uh, probably this will be uh, at least partially a review, but I hope to have some new information even for uh, some of the more experienced editors out there. Uh, I've done a kind of a mix between small pub uh, co and contracting with authors uh, directly. Uh, there are uh, several books that I've edited that are still in the publishing pipeline. They're not released yet. Uh, I haven't actually added the last couple uh, to this slide uh, yet. Let me get out of the way so you can see that last one. But uh, it's cool when something that I've uh, been the editor for wins an award, and I really love cheering on my authors when they can find the success like that. But it's really kind of funny how I ended up doing editing because I was asked if I could do a proofread uh, for a particular book that was getting ready to be published. And so I said, oh, sure. Um, I went through and noticed that it really wasn't edited to the level of needing a proofread yet. It turns out that I turned in a list of edits that was, uh, I think, over a thousand edits long on something that was supposed to be down to where maybe a dozen or so things could be found on it. Uh, so I turned that in, uh, including what could have uh, actually qualified as developmental edits, a lot of line edits, uh, editing. And so the... Uh, Editor-in-chief actually agreed with me, luckily. And so ever since I've done uh, several edits per year, uh, whether it's with uh, this publisher, it was Immortal Works that I do most of my editing with, but I also have done some freelancing there. I'm a software engineer by day, so you give me a rule set and I know exactly what to do with that rule set. And so I kind of fit well into that uh, editing arena. The trick is to really preserve all the right stuff, like the voice of the author when I'm following all of those rules and telling you, okay, here's something that you could do differently. Here's a way you could improve. Uh, so I'm hoping to show you a lot of those sorts of things. Um, I have friends that have probably edited hundreds of novels. So yeah, they're a little bit... Uh, farther along the road than I am, but I really do uh, hope that you can gain something from the techniques and things that I'm gonna show you here today. So when do, what am I going to cover? Um, editing tricks that you can use on your own to improve your writing. Um, one thing that I like to point out is for most people, that is not going to be enough. Almost everybody needs an editor. Uh, as an editor, I also hire editors to write, uh, to edit my stories that I write. And so you need to plan for that external help as well. But I'm primarily going to be just covering what to do before you go for that outside help. Uh, I'm going to talk about several editing tools and related uh, tools, authoring tools, how you can use those uh, effectively. 
Um, you know, the reason I glance over here, I've, I've got my slide over here. And so I'll be looking all over the place and hopefully back at you fairly often. Uh, but there are some similarities um, when an author works with an editor to, to what we're going to be uh, going over here. There are a lot of different cases for when you're working with an editor versus when you're doing your own editing. Uh, let's see. Uh, a lot of this really applies whether you're doing your own edit or whether you are working uh, to edit somebody else's. Uh, so uh, if you're worried about, oh, I don't want to know just how to edit my own stuff. I want to know about editing in general. Yeah, we'll cover some of that too. So what I won't cover, uh, not particularly uh, anything on networking and making contacts, uh, alpha and beta readers, feedback from critique groups or others, uh, they all apply to editing and involve other people. And so I don't think I'll do more than just do a light touch on some of those things. So tools, word processors are the primary tool of an editor. Uh, I've listed several here. Uh, I'll be going over a little bit of detail on each of those. Uh, and so they each have their pluses and minuses, uh, especially when it comes to editing. So I'll go over a little bit more on each of those. Uh, for instance, Microsoft Word. Uh, Microsoft Word can be a little bit expensive. And if you are on a really tight budget, uh, there are some things that you can uh, do uh, to kind of get around that. Uh, I think they're usually trying to set that up as a subscription now. Uh, some people that works really well, others not so much. Me personally, I like just buying my tools outright. Uh, that's more comfortable for the way I like to work with things. But one of the things you have to be aware of is in all of these things I'm going to talk about, uh, some of them are going to be very much what's going to work best for you because there's a distinct difference in the feel and the process and a lot of the things that you can do there. Uh, so with Word, for instance, it has a good spell checker and some basic grammar checking. But one of the things that you really need to get much more familiar with on this uh, is the review tab. Here, let me give you a view of that right here. The review tab. Uh, has a lot of cool things on here. I can show you spelling and grammar. You've got the button right up here at the top. So that's like the very first minimal pass of what you can do there. Um, once you actually get into editing and trading things back and forth with people, yeah, you need to learn about track changes and things like that. Uh, and so that's going to be part of that editing process, but I'm really not going to go into that very much right here. And so your primary thing for your self-editing is going to be that spelling and grammar. But I really need to emphasize that's a first step. Uh, and so you always need to run that uh, because it's generally pretty fast on a full novel. If you discover that that is not really fast on a full novel, you... Uh, you might have some other things that you need to pay a little bit more attention to. Maybe delve a little more into uh, learning what all of those nitpicky grammar rules are and things like that. But you would be really surprised at how many people don't bother running that uh, last spell check before they send something in uh, to an editor or a beta reader group or whatever it is. Uh, so... The more details that I have on that, I'll, I'll be going into more information on things you can do specifically with Word that are not going to show up right on the menus for you. So I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more later, but I wanted to go over some of the more general information for the other tools first. Um, for instance, with Scrivener, um, I really like using Scrivener as my editing. Uh, tool where I write, where I do my first pass editing. It helps me organize and shuffle scenes back and forth because that's what it's designed for. One of the problems with Scrivener is uh, it has a kind of a complex interface. This is one of those things where maybe it'll work for you, maybe it won't. Some people really love getting in and doing all of the fancy things like color coding it by who the point of view character is, all sorts of fun things that you can do. And other people, that's just overwhelming. They want a word processor, type the words in, done. And so it kind of depends on 
your writing process and what you're willing to delve into as to whether this is useful. It has about the same level of spell check and grammar check as you might find in Word. Uh, if you're looking into purchasing Scrivener, it's usually, I think, 49 bucks, but you can generally find it on sale if you wait around for a little while for half off. We actually had some Scrivener licenses at our uh, League of Utah Writers uh, fundraiser the end of July, and so they were on auction, and somebody got a really killer deal for like 10 bucks or less. Um, but it is really good for the organizing, outlining, uh, typing, uh, first pass editing, uh, and it really is great for left-brained people. Uh, it's not something that I would really uh, encourage if you're more into the layout for publishing, although it can export ebook formats. Um, there are lots of classes if you want to get in and figure out the best ways to use Scrivener and the things that it can do for you in that editing process. Let's see what other stuff we've got here. Open Office is another one. Uh, the benefit here is it's free and it can import and export read and write the docx uh, format. And so it will work uh, in the place of Microsoft Word. Uh, it used to be really rough on uh, formatting things identically, but I think that's been actually improving quite a bit with later versions. Uh, and I don't think that the spelling and grammar is quite to the extent and quite the polish level that Word has, but uh, it's going to be enough for you if you're really looking for something inexpensive to get you those uh, basics on the editing process. And so yeah, I think it has improved to where that's actually a pretty good uh, option for uh, a draft or editing copy. Uh, just don't get really fancy with formatting. That's something that you probably don't want to worry about during your editing process. Uh, Google Docs is in about the same category as OpenOffice with one really notable exception. Uh, it's cloud-based, you can edit from anywhere, and it really is collaboration friendly. Uh, this is a big deal if you are going to be co-writing something with uh, other people. Uh, and so the ability to get in and have multiple people writing on the same doc, uh, editing at the same time, can be a really big deal in that case. Uh, it should have about the same level of spelling and grammar. And one of the other things is other tools can plug into uh, web-based editors. And so if you've got something uh, that has those sorts of plugins, Google Docs kind of inherits those additional tools and it can work out really nicely. Well, one thing to do to understand, I had mentioned it very briefly up front, is that every tool will lie to you on grammar updates from time to time because it doesn't really understand the nuances uh, in sentence structure. Uh, these tools are improving all the time, but well, it's kind of like trying to make something idiot proof. Uh, the universe always builds a better idiot. Uh, and I also wanted to very briefly mention several other things that are kind of hanging around the periphery as we're doing editing. You've got cloud storage, PDF readers, Calibre is a tool, the Kindle. Uh, I have a Kindle that I'll sometimes do interesting things uh, like uh, loading documents onto it. So I'll go over each of these kind of briefly. Uh, I'm going to try to get through a bunch of this introductory stuff so that we can get to some of the meatier bits of editing, which is probably what you are here for. So hold on just a little bit as I finish up this uh, introductory bit here. Uh, one of the things that's a critical part for editing is that you must be able to back up to an earlier version if you somehow manage to destroy a document with a wayward search and replace. Uh, things can go very badly if you have the wrong key at the wrong time uh, with search and replace, or you've accidentally highlighted an entire paragraph or an entire chapter and hit a backspace and don't notice. So having something on the cloud or something in backups is really critical especially if you're trying to do search and replace on a name that happens to be a valid and common verb or a noun, 
yeah, things like that can really go bad in a hurry for you and destroy a document. And so always have a way to get back to an earlier version. Also, uh, cloud storage, you have to be really careful with tools that will write a lot of files in rapid succession uh, because sometimes Google Drive and other tools might end up getting conflicts if you do too much of that writing files, just a whole batch of files writing one right after the other. Uh, most tools like Microsoft Word won't do that very much. But you have to be a little bit careful and check from time to time to see if your cloud storage is giving you conflicts. Uh, a way around this is if you just write your story using local hard drive and back up to your cloud storage. So there are options and ways to get around some of those issues. But cloud storage really does some nice things like protecting you from computer crashes. Um, some of them find, uh, will give you backups. Some of them may not. So be careful with that. Uh, I typically will use Google Docs. Uh, other people that I know use Dropbox extensively or OneDrive. There are a lot of things out there. Some internet service providers will give you storage space. So a lot of different ways that you can use to back up and recover if you have an edit that goes the wrong way. PDF readers. This is an interesting one because I started using PDF readers to do some of my editing process when I wanted to have it read back to me. It turns out Microsoft Word does that uh, now as a built-in feature. Uh, Kindle does that now also, and so that particular bit of it didn't uh, come in all that handy anymore uh, once I got those features from other software. One thing that PDF uh, readers will do is if you export it and send a PDF to outside readers, they can comment without modifying it. So that's uh, as far as I'm going to go into that one right there. Uh, but you can't really use read aloud on Scrivener generated PDF files because I think it also will try to read all of your headers and all your footers and, and it, it makes a mess of things when it's trying to read it that way. So. There are some things that you need to watch out for if you want to just use it to export to something that you can listen to as you're walking or on the treadmill or whatever you're doing. Uh, Calibre <clears throat> does file format conversions, uh, manages ebook libraries, uh, great for managing ebook data. So this is one of those things that I just wanted to briefly mention that could come in handy, but not really all that much for your self editing. Uh, but for Kindle, uh, one of the things that I've done before is I have a half hour commute uh, to and from work and I will stick a work on pro in progress on my Kindle sometimes and listen to it using text to speech as I'm driving. Uh, one thing to be aware of there is you're not going to have time to stop and make notes while you're driving because you probably aren't all that fond of expensive tickets or expensive uh, accident repairs. So just listening is great. Uh, if you're just doing like your final proofread before you send it to somebody else, that might be a good opportunity for just sticking it on your Kindle, sticking it in your car. You can listen to it as you drive. One thing about the audio uh, text-to-speech, I've found that if I have somebody else in the car, it really annoys them because not only is the text-to-voice an acquired taste, I also put my replay speed back uh, fairly high to like 1.5, 1.75. And if somebody's not used to that, it's just this chattering gibberish in the background. And a lot of people really don't like that. And so it really is kind of an acquired taste to be able to make good use of that. So methods that we can use. And so these are some areas where I'm going to dig a little bit deeper. Uh, I've got the spelling and the grammar checkers. I have a search and destroy list all to talk about, wildcard hunts, reading aloud, uh, reading things backwards, going over things one sentence at a time specifically, uh, online tools. And so I've got uh, a little bit more detail on going into each of these. And so with spelling and grammar checkers, these are what you can do as a great first pass. Um, they can be wrong, so you really do have to always verify things. This is a case where if you don't know the rules and can't tell when these tools are telling you something wrong about whether a comma goes there or doesn't go there, and learning those rules is 
kind of a rite of passage and it will help you in the long run because the cleaner your manuscript is before it gets to a publisher or an editor, the better off you will be because you will be saving them time. They will enjoy working with you more if you're not having them go into all of the little itty bitty details of things that you could actually handle up front. So never ever hit OK without checking and understanding what it's talking about. The internet is a great resource there because if it's saying you've got a dependent clause or an independent clause, you can just go out and Google that and say, okay, when am I supposed to use these? Just to make sure if you're not really sure what you're doing uh, on some of those uh, finer details. But yeah, seriously, make sure it is right. I made the extra bullet point there just to make sure on that. But one thing to be aware of is that different tools are going to have different specialties. Uh, some of them are going to be better at uh, finding passive voice, for instance, while others may have a lot more detailed reports. Like Pro Writing Aid, that's one of my favorites, uh, and it does a bunch of reports. Actually, I have it sitting over here. I can show you. If we go into the reports list here, you've got each one of these buttons across the top is a report. And if I click here, these are the reports that it couldn't show you on the list. And this is another one of those cases where I'm a software engineer. Give me a list of 20 reports and I really love that. Other people look at that and it's shell shock. They don't know where to start. And so when you are evaluating tools for whether they're going to fit into your flow, you might need to give them a little time to see if you like the way that it works. It might take a little getting used to, but I'm pretty sure you're going to end up with a favorite, things that work a lot better than others. And so it really is going to depend on which ones you feel the most comfortable using. So, uh, you know, you've got all of these different spelling and grammar checkers. I mentioned Word, OpenOffice, all the others. They all have at least the basics. So there are some other things that I wanted to go over as well. But yeah, the spelling and grammar checkers, they work best if you know what uh, those rules are and you're just using the tool to help you verify. Because it's really easy to just, as you're reading through, accidentally skip over something that you know the rule and you just, well, yeah, I used the wrong form of two in this one place. Uh, things like that. Okay, there's also homophones, finding the right word. Uh, yeah, sounding like the right word is not good enough. Now, I actually have a uh, blog entry here. If you look at johnemolson.blogspot.com, in the 2016 uh, category, I can just bring this up here really briefly and pop it over and show you what I'm talking about. This was a pet peeves thing because I see a lot of these. I see right here even, I've got the word a lot, which is not a word. It's either a lot, but then you can actually a lot things, which is a completely different word. Uh, so I've gone through and just made this huge list of things that some people get wrong. And it started out as a list of things that I knew I had to work on. And so it helped for me to put these together uh, just to make that list of things to watch out for, like lose versus loose. A lot of people will just accidentally type the wrong word, and it's really hard to see the difference. Uh, one of the things that can help is if you end up having your computer read the story back to you, some of those things become a little more obvious. Uh, but then versus then, all these sorts of things, there's rules for each of these things, and some of them can be a little bit confusing. And uh, so it's something to watch out for there. So let me pop back over to here. Uh, so that's making sure you find the right word. Uh, there's also my actual search and destroy list, the things that I know I have done wrong. Uh, this words to avoid, uh, I'll pop that one up here and show it to you. Um, one of the first things that I heard back from my editor is everybody was always looking at things. They looked here, they looked there, they saw stuff, and I had used it like hundreds of times. And so I put that on my list of things to not do anymore. And so now my first pass copy is a lot better because I've been through the pain of learning what my weak spots were. And so I've got this 
other document, my pet peeves number eight, and I've got a lot of different things. Some of these are really good just as a uh, general checklist. Uh, for instance, you have things like having bad starts that tend to be a little on the weak side, like there is, there was, there, all those sorts of things. Uh, typical weak words, just. Just is usually making an excuse for something that you're not very confident about. But one of the things that helps is to convert those wishy-washy words into something that's definite. Readers like seeing confidence in your writing. And if you can get rid of some of these weak words, of course, you always end up with a case where, yeah, that is the exact right word that you need in that case. And so I'm not telling you you have to delete all of these things. It's just these are things that you might want to pay attention to. Uh, passive voice tags, things that are easy to find there, uh, senses and emotion. If you can avoid these sorts of words when you're going through senses and emotion and put it much more directly into your point of view character's uh, head, those work really well. Now, there's one thing here on uh, passive voice. I'll go into this a little bit more in more detail, but you can do wildcard searches in Microsoft Word. And these are a, a really cool thing that can help uh, find, because you can do a search and it will highlight everything where you're typing the word was and something that ended in ed or ended in ing. And so you can find all of these things with a search, and it's not something that you would typically know that Microsoft Word would know how to do. So I've actually got a screen to go into a little bit more detail on that right here. Uh, so you can see it a little bit better in the larger size. Um, and so with wildcard searches, I can actually show you really quickly how to get to this mode. So let me bring Word up here. If you are doing a search and you go into advanced find, uh, your advanced find dialog, you can uh, open up more. And right here is your use wildcards tag. So that's the important magic sauce that you have to turn on in order to do a wildcard search with these kinds of expressions. And so uh, this is just like programming talk for things like the word bin with lots of lot and lots of other letters followed by ing. And so it really does help to identify all of those uh, passive voice things. Uh, again, you're going to find cases where, yes, this is what you meant to do and this is what you need to do in that particular case. Uh, and so this is not a goal of finding all of these things and getting rid of all of them. This is just find the ones that are kind of weak where you could be much more uh, strong in your writing. You get rid of those uh, weak words and things will work a lot more smoothly for you and your readers will be more engaged. And that's kind of the goal here is you want to get rid of the things that they would end up skipping over and get their attention riveted more on it. Uh, as I had already mentioned, reading aloud is the... It's a great thing that you can do uh, to help uh, find things. Uh, homophones, like I talked about earlier, uh, duplicate words are a, a really easy one to find if you tell your computer to read the text to you aloud. Uh, like you have an and, especially if one is at the end of a line and the next one is at the beginning of the line, those are almost impossible to see. Uh, and so if you have your computer read those things to you, they become glaringly obvious. And so you can say, oh, I, I just need to pause it here. You go back, you edit, and then you continue with your read through. And it works wonderfully. Uh, and you can adjust the speed of the voice uh, playback, lots of different things that make it uh, easy to kind of fine tune to what's going to work really well for you. And you know, homophones can really cause you merry mischief in an audiobook, even if the text is right. And so having it read it aloud to you, you can sometimes get a feel for how the flow is working. And that's kind of the, the backup 30,000 foot view of editing where you're not just going through into the nitpicky details, but you're getting things that are going to have better comprehension. Uh, and so it's like the difference between gorilla and gorilla. Am I talking about warfare or animals? 
uh, if it's not clear in the context of the sentence, those are some of the things that you might notice when it's reading aloud if you're not following along in the text. Um, now, for me personally, I really do like following along in the text because sometimes I'll spot a word where it sounded right, but I look at it and think, no, no, that's not the right word, and so I can go back and edit that. And so it helps me just keep track of where I am and the content as I'm going through it. Uh, there are lots of different things that you can do with this uh, read aloud. Uh, some of you might have a, a very good friend who will actually read it aloud for you. And that's got its own benefits because you find out where those stumbling points are for smooth flow and comprehension. Uh, if you can't read it easily, nobody else can either. Uh, and so at a minimum, you can make the computer read it for you, but uh, it really does help you in a lot of different areas. Now, oh, reading backwards. Uh, I'm not talking about word by word backwards, but maybe paragraph by paragraph and possibly sentence by sentence. One of the advantages of this is it helps you disassociate the story from the text. When you're editing, you want to pay much more attention to the text when you're not doing the really high level uh, story kind of edits, when you're trying to find those typos and other things like that, when you're looking for, does this sentence work? You can analyze it one sentence at a time, but it's easy to get distracted by the story if you're just reading through uh, as you would normally. But if you go through a sentence at a time backwards or a paragraph at a time backwards, it helps you to focus on the words and the sentence structure. And so, yeah, if you want to do a really good job with your editing, what you need to do is choose when to be thorough and not if you're going to be thorough. And so there, I'm giving you all these different options for how you can approach things. And some of these may be uh, ideal for you and others completely alien feeling processes that just don't match up with the way you like working. So I'm hoping with the way I'm sort of throwing a lot of things out here, you can find something in that mix that is really going to help with your process. Uh, and so, yeah, one of the things that we need to do is if we really want to succeed, it takes being thorough as we go through. That's one of the downsides of editing is a lot of people don't like that level of detail and they feel it's really a burden to go through the editing. They don't like it. They're not good at it. But with practice, it's something that you can become a lot better at and get through it really fast so you can get back to the part you uh, really like. Uh, as soon as your editing is done, you can get to the writing again. Uh, and yeah, writing is where a lot of us want to spend most of our time. And so it's it's a matter of identifying these things getting to where we are better at editing and more comfortable with it, finding what techniques are going to work best for us. So yeah, the one sentence at a time, I've kind of uh, gone over that already. Uh, one thing I really wanted to point out here though, it's something that I learned from Howard Taylor. Uh, when he was doing his Schlock Mercenary comic, he did a presentation on it once. And he said, for humor, you always want to put the funny word last. Now, of course, anytime you hear this, always, it's one of those things where, yeah, there's always going to be exceptions too. Uh, and so if you put the important word last as a kind of a guiding rule there, that's one of those things that can help put the punch where it's going to make the most difference as you're editing. So there are lots of little things like this that you can keep an eye out for. And it's one of those cases where, yeah, the first time you go through and you edit an entire novel, you think, okay, I've got this. And then the next time you think, oh, I missed these things. Or you go to a class and you hear another technique and you realize you completely skipped over some new technique that you think is going to really help because it matches the way you like to do things. That's going to be part of the process, and life is just like that. You're going to continuously learn new things. Uh, you're always going to be improving. You're going to be a better editor on your own work over time. And so you just need to get used to that being part of that progression, that process that we're all going to be going through. Uh, and good editors uh, will quite often do something really close to this whole one sentence at a time thing, 
for an entire manuscript, and that's why they deserve to get paid what they get paid, because there are some editors that are exceptionally good at this sort of thing, and why some of them, some of them can really command a premium price, because they're really good at it. So, online grammar tools. Uh, there are some that are very useful. Some of them have really nice, simple, easy-to-use interfaces. Others are more complex. I'm going to go over a little bit on some of them to show you what they look like. Uh, for instance, the Hemingway app. Let me pop that one up here again. They have a sample page that they bring up uh, when you hit their web page, and it shows how they color code things and give highlights, and they can give you uh, down the side here some indicators for the sorts of things that you are looking for. And so this is a very visually oriented, user-friendly thing. It doesn't have as much detail as you're going to find in other tools, but it really does help with evaluating things like reading level, uh, sentence complexity, phrase use, adverbs, passive voice. So there are a lot of different things that you can get out of that. Uh, it's not perfect, but it can point out some really significant issues for you. One of the things you have to watch out for is it's not designed to throw your entire novel into their web interface. It'll just choke and die most of the time. And so you'll have to put things in maybe a chapter or a scene at a time and evaluate it that way. But you also still need to know when to ignore its recommendations, just like with all of the other tools. Another one is Grammarly. They have an online tool that you can use as well. Now, I've used the paid version of Grammarly. Uh, I ended up, just because of the way I like to work, gravitating more towards uh, pro writing aid. But they all cover some of the same ground with uh, grammar and spelling checkers. Uh, some of them have a deeper analysis in one area versus another area. And so it's a matter of testing out all of these tools really to find out which will work best for you. And a lot of things will have either a free uh, version that you can test or a plugin that you can try out. And so you don't have to decide up front if you're going to invest the money in one of these uh, professional subscriptions or something like that. So it, it really is fairly easy to uh, evaluate these things by just plugging some of your writing into it uh, with these uh, online tools. One thing that you may need to be careful of with the installers that some of these will use, uh, some tools might try to uh, install things like new web search engines for you, and it can be a little annoying that way. And sometimes scammers will come up with website names that are like the one that you want to go to, and they're hoping to sucker people in uh, to their site. And so you have to be careful to make sure you know you're really at the correct site on some of these. And let's see, standalone grammar tools. This is the Pro Writing Aid header that I showed you before. Uh, so this is one of them that I really bought the permanent version of because I like the way it works and it matches the way I like to work. Uh, some really worry about using uh, to, about losing the unique voice of your writing when you're using one of these grammar tools. And that's a very good point because you have to understand when these tools are doing something that is going to be voice unfriendly, where it's trying to sterilize everything to say, oh, this expression should be uh, given this way. Well, no, maybe you have a very specific reason we're using what wouldn't be the standard way of saying something. Uh, particularly inside dialogue, you have to be careful not to follow the rules that these tools will give you all of the time, especially when you're looking at suggestions versus the actual grammar to, uh, rules where, yeah, the comma is supposed to go here on this kind of a clause and it's not supposed to go here. And so you have to be uh, really wary if you... Uh, want to preserve that writer voice, which is one of the reasons people will read your book is because they like the way you write. Uh, you don't want to make it feel generic just because you went through and okayed everything that the uh, grammar tool said you should change. And so that's that's a matter of looking at the way you write versus the way it says you ought to write and recognizing which of those things are rules versus voice. Uh, and so also, with all of these tools, just like the simpler grammar checkers, they will make mistakes, and there is no substitute for knowing what those real rules are. Uh, 
And so it's something where the more you write, the more you read, the more you take classes on editing, uh, the more online uh, instruction you go through, the better off you're going to be. Uh, so just a real summary here. Um, whether you're self-editing, uh, whether you're editing something for someone else, you should never have to uh, do all of that on your own. And there are ways of bringing other people into the process, but that's kind of the next step beyond what I wanted to cover with this class. Uh, a lot of people will consider writing to be a very solitary activity and for the most part it is but it really does help when you get to that point after the writing to where you start involving other people uh, some writers will take their chapter by chapter and send it out to their beta readers that way rather than waiting until they're done with an entire novel uh, others will line up people to look at it after the edited the entire thing first pass. That's my uh, personal take on how I like to do things because I end up finding something toward the end of the book where, oh, you know what? If I go back to chapter one, I can insert something. Uh, I actually have a science fiction series that I've just released book one on that series. And I had the luxury of writing all three before the first one came out. And so I'm most of the way through book two and I realize, oh, you know what? I have a prime opportunity to reference something here most of the way through book two by putting one sentence in the first paragraph of book one. And so just doing things like that, uh, it happens sometimes on the single book level, sometimes on the single chapter level, sometimes you can do it on the entire series level. And that level of editing is really cool when you can pull that off to have the flexibility to go back and insert those things. Uh, some seat of the pants writers might have a heavier editing cycle because of needing to do things like that, where if you're a really strong outliner, those things might already be planned in and part of your manuscript. And so the way you work really does vary a lot on editing based on how you do your writing, because some kinds of writing will uh, put a lot of those changes in the writing process to where it doesn't feel like it's part of the editing process. It's kind of a trade-off on how those sorts of things go. Um, we do have a little bit of time, I think, for uh, a couple of questions. Uh, if you happen to have some questions, you can put them in the chat, and then we will have somebody that can uh, see if there's anything there that I can address for you really quickly. We have some ready to go for you. Uh, we have one question from Acacia, who asks, how can a writer determine that their self-editing process is finished and their writing is ready for outside help? Yeah, that's a really tough one for the first time you're going through the process. Uh, after you've been through it a couple of times, that really does get a lot easier. Um, reminds me of when I did my uh, fictionalized biography when I had no idea what editing actually was. I'd been, been through it and I thought, okay, I've got all of the typos done. I'm done editing, right? Well, no, I wasn't done editing because I didn't realize all of these other things involved, like the story structure and all that. But if you can go through it uh, and you don't have a list of dozens of fixes that you needed to make, that's a pretty good indicator, especially if you're looking at some of these tools if you've got a huge list on some of these tools, that might be an indicator that you've got a little bit more that you can do. Uh, although I have finished books that uh, Pro Writing Aid says, oh, you've got a thousand things that you ought to address here. And well, no, those are things that I did on purpose. They, they might be words that I spelled differently because it's a science fiction story, those sorts of things. And so that's kind of how you might be able to address that. Am I done yet? Another I question? I love the advice that you have. I have a question here from Jenna, who asks, how do I manage not being overwhelmed by all of the changes that I need or want to make? Do you have any tips? Well, it's only overwhelming if you're trying to look at the whole book all at once. It's the whole, how do you eat an elephant kind of thing. If you want to just focus down and say, okay, today I'm looking at my first paragraph of my first chapter, 
How is that going? And if you can go through and make sure you've got that doing what you want it to, it can give you a little bit more confidence that, okay, it's time to move to the next. And you can just progress down through that. It's scarier the more you think you have to do all at once. And editing isn't an all at once process. You just need to figure out, this is the piece I'm going to be addressing now. I'm going to look at passive voice today, for instance. Uh, I'm going to look at passive voice in chapter one today. Uh, however you want to break that down, if you can find that small piece that you can hold the whole thing in your head all at once, that's where it becomes a lot easier and a lot less overwhelming. Thank you. I have a question of my own uh, that's actually very similar to another question from Jenna. When you're getting advice from other people, how do you know when it's better to stick with your gut or when it's better to listen to that advice? Where do you draw the line for stylistic editing like that? Um, a lot of that depends on the source of the advice and if you have more than one person giving you that same recommendation. If you've got 10 people that are looking at your writing and one person says, I think maybe you've got this thing wrong, uh, that's a whole different story than if you've got five people saying, I don't know what's going on here. Uh, so having more than one person look at it is a really good indicator there. Another really good indicator for who you ought to listen to the most is they shouldn't be telling you how to fix your problems. They should be telling you either I was confused or I was bored. Those are the two big signals you should be looking for. Anything else is they see some problem and they're trying to get a handle on it. If they're saying this doesn't work in this paragraph, the rest of what they may, uh, may have to say about it might be bad advice, but you can look at that paragraph and wonder, okay, how did they get misled? Is there something I can change? Just knowing there's some trigger here in this paragraph that uh, tripped them up. So that's one of the things that you can do to kind of gauge the value of the advice that you're getting. That will honestly help me personally a lot. Uh, we have another question here from Vibeke Hyatt, who asks, do you ever edit by hand or solely on the computer? Um, I am a software engineer. I type all day, every day. Writing things out by hand is what I do when I don't have a computer handy. Uh, <laughs> personally, everything is uh, on the computer. Uh, being in software and typing and editing and moving back and forth in the documents, that's how I naturally write. And so uh, it may be bad process uh, for me personally, because if I'm in the flow of the story, sometimes I think, oh, I just need to go back and change this word. And I sometimes get lost in that where I should be in writing mode and I pop into editing mode when I shouldn't. So that's one of the downsides of being in that keyboard only mode. And so, yeah, there are trade-offs that you have to kind of train yourself to get around. I think that is all the time we have this afternoon. Thank you so much again for presenting with us. This is John M. Olson, uh, and his website is on the screen currently, and also in the chat history. Uh, thanks once again for coming to the Edge of the Universe. If you like what you see here, consider attending our main convention in February. Our website is ltue.net. Thank you, everybody. Thanks.